Hello everyone, wishing you all a very good evening and a very warm welcome to our Facebook Live session today. Thank you so much for joining us. Medfin is redefining the future of surgeries in India by offering the latest surgical procedures at lowest rates. Medfin also offers latest daycare procedures, which ensures lesser pain, lesser hospital stay, and of course, quicker recovery. At Medfin, we also work with top surgeons, state-of-the-art medical facilities to bring the best care to you at affordable prices. Think surgery, think medfin. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our doctor for today's session, Dr. Kiran Chaka. A very warm welcome to you, doctor. Hi, good afternoon. Dr. Kiran is a joint replacement surgeon and a specialist in arthroscopy and sports medicine with experience of working at premier centers for arthroscopy, arthroplasty, and trauma. In addition to specializing in joint replacement, Dr. Kiran has experience in hip resurfacing surgery, minimally invasive surgery, custom fit knee replacement, unicompartmental knee replacement, patellofemoral replacement. Doctor, a very warm welcome to you. We have about 30 minutes in our session today. So without any delay, I would like to quickly jump into the questions. Uh, could you please tell us or help us understand the anatomy of a hip? Yeah. Uh... Uh, hip joint is a connecting joint between the trunk as well as the lower limb. So basically it is made up of two bones. Uh, it is a ball and socket type of joint. Uh, there, are, there are two bones which are, uh, let me show you what are two bones. This is called as hip bone, as you can see all here. And uh, this is the thigh bone. So the joint between this hip bone and the thigh bone, the femur, is called as a hip joint. It, 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 it is formed by these two bones with some musculature and ligaments. Okay, okay. Thank you, Doctor. And what is the different type of arthritis that can affect the hip? Hip, basically it is, see, uh, they have the most commonest problem which the hip faces is avian, avascular necrosis of femoral head. What happens is in this disease, the head of the femur, we call this as the head of the femur, mm -hmm. there is a lack of blood supply to this part of the bone and then this bone goes for necrosis. Then it leads to arthritis. The life for this bone, this part of the bone is uh, like uh, diminished and the blood supply is diminished. So that leads to a necrosis and that leads to arthritis. So basically hip, the problems faced by the hips regarding to arthritis is the traumatic uh, post avian we call as avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Mm -hmm. Then there is a post infective post tuberculosis disease and the rheumatoid disease as well as ankylosing spondylitis. These are the commonly faced problems in the hip arthritis. Okay. And who should go for hip replacement or when is it the right time to go for a hip replacement surgery? See, see, anyone who is undergoing, uh, see, uh, what my criteria is if the patient is uh, suffering with hip pain or he has been diagnosed by an orthopedic surgeon with uh, some certain investigations like X-ray and MRI. And if the uh, patient is uh, suffering with this uh, hip pain for more than six months and if he is crippled because of this disease, he is not able to walk for more than half a kilometer, he is limping. Nowadays, many of the patients, they don't want to limp. Yes, mm -hmm. in the past, what we used to do is we used to postpone the disease. In sense, we used to ask the patients to come back after one year, two years, or certain uh, time. Uh, avian, for example, can be, uh, we can just push the patient away from the surgery for at least three, four, five, six years based on the patient's uh, acceptance. Nowadays, but nobody wants to live a life with pain. They don't want to have a crippled life. They don't want to have a... Uh, mercy life. That's what they call them. Call me. They, that's what they tell me. So, uh, someone who has severe pain, someone who has shortening, mm -hmm. someone who uh, is not able to sleep properly in the night, or they have disturbance in the sleep, mm -hmm. and uh, someone who is not having finding it difficult to climb the stairs and having a social stigma, or someone uh, even uh, they are not able to have a uh, lead a happy, healthy life. Right. These are the people whom I suggest to go for a hip replacement surgery. True. And uh, is there any way to avoid the surgery? So what could somebody do to avoid surgery? Yeah. yeah. See, I didn't get you. What did you say? What are the other treatments for bad hip? Yes. Yes. 
see when the patients come to us for the initial stages nowadays everybody is aware as you know uh, we are going through the pandemic also nobody wants to have any other health issues even if simple problems yeah they, it's better the i see lot many patients angsters especially or whoever it is whenever they have a pain which is disturbing them for more than 3 weeks they come to us in the initial one or two stage there are certain medicines with which we can treat certain types of diseases like avian that will be a, a part of avian which is a uh, progressive disease uh, which is very difficult to treat as well but the thing is it can be treated initially at least to postpone the disease in such situations there are certain medicines which we give and in case of uh, natural osteoarthritis which is very rare in indian population which mm-hmm. is commonly seen in the caucasians the osteoarthritis just like what if we indians we uh, go through uh, osteoarthritis of the knee joint the mm-hmm. natural disease the age related uh, degenerative disease of the knees what we call as osteoarthritis in the same fashion it happens with the knee hips also the wear and tear leads to hip arthritis that is more common in caucasians or the whites or the westerners in certain situations we can just postpone the disease by giving certain medicines like uh, uh, we give a certain calcium some vitamins and there are certain supplements for the joint arthritis as well like collagen peptide and undegenerated collagen peptide there are certain new drugs which are definitely benefiting patients which can be used to postpone the surgery and and coming to certain simple procedures like in avian we do uh, what we call as co decompression there is a tension in the uh, uh, head of the femur what we do is we make a hole in the head of the femur through from outside so by doing that thing there there are chances that the blood supply will be regained by the head and uh, the disease can be postponed we're coming to other parts like there are certain osteotomies corrective osteotomies which we do it for the youngsters like like pediatric age group or adults adolescents to postpone the disease okay and is it only due to age that somebody could have hip problem or uh, sports injury are there any other reasons why somebody could have a back hip yeah as i told you earlier like uh, there are certain diseases which will lead to osteoarthritis of the hip they are rheumatoid arthritis okay there is one more disease called as ankylosing spondylitis and there are autoimmune other autoimmune diseases which might lead to osteoarthritis of the hip joint with saying this they are the the most common thing is post traumatic the patients will have post acromalar fractures the patients will have osteoarthritis early osteoarthritis of the hip joint and then the common thing is uh, the age related osteoarthritis okay what is the pro- what is the difference between hip replacement and hip resurfacement yeah that's what i was telling you see like what happens is in hip replacement it's totally about total hip replacement we replace the socket this is the bone socket we put a cap here and uh, we replace the stem also we remove this part of the head we remove it off and put an artificial head with a stem there are three parts i'll just show you just a moment uh one is it fine if i show you the model if you want yeah. me to show you i'm so sorry yeah this is called a stem and this is the head right in the same fashion there is a cup here into the hip which goes into the hip bone so this is called as a total hip replacement surgery we replace the head as well as the socket when coming back to the hip resurfacement what we do is in the natural bone in the natural bone we just resurface only the surface of the bone is replaced with the metal cap and even at the acetabulum that is the hip bone we just put one metal cap here so it is not we are not going to sacrifice the neck or even the head a part of head is removed and it is resurfaced resurfaced with the metal that is called as hip resurfacement that we usually do it for avians and osteoarthritis secondary to that thing in indian scenario it is a bit difficult because the sizes of the femur is less mm-hmm. uh, it is usually done in caucasians where the size of the hip is a bit bigger there are certain complications involved with the uh, hip resurfacement but the best surgery is hip replacement surgery okay and what are the tests that are done to diagnose the requirement of a hip replacement how do you decide if somebody should undergo a hip replacement yeah once a patient comes to us <clears throat> we definitely go through their history 
we asked them if they had taken any steroid uh, steroid to rule out uh, the steroid induced avian we asked them their what are the medications what they take either they are diabetic or hypertensive so all things matters mm-hmm. and we even checked their bmi that is uh, body, body mass index and people who are on a heavier side they are prone for this thing females are a bit prone for this thing and uh, so after so all the history taking we get the simple investigations ex- uh, x-rays are done uh, if we have certain doubt in the in grade 1 and grade 2 we just get an mri scan done also for to rule out if there is other problems like avian or infective pathology and after certain this all investigations we go ahead and plan for the hip replacement surgery these are the basic investigations what we get it done okay and how long would the surgery be doctor what happens during the surgery yes yes see um, i will tell you the procedure see what happens is once the patient is uh, coming to the hospital we diagnose that thing and we tell we fix up the date it's an it's a elective surgery it's not an emergency surgery hip replacement even it's almost like 99% it's an elective surgery we fix up a date uh, and uh, the day the patient is admitted we get all the blood investigations done and make the patient fit and fine we analyze the hemodynamic status also the next morning when we start the surgery we make the patient lie on the uh, couch the usually it is done under spinal anesthesia basically what we do is epidural a combined uh, spinal and epidural anesthesia which has the benefits of uh, withstanding the surgery for longer duration if in case needed as well as it have it gives uh, a comfort for the patient because he will be awake uh, and uh, the only the lower part of the body is anesthetized and the patient is made to lie on the couch uh, the and, and on the operation table so we start with skin incision as i'm telling you then uh, we cut out the damaged piece of the bone we just basically cut out this damaged piece of the bone and we prepare the acetabulum the thigh the hip bone with uh, sequential uh, reaming we fix up the cup in the acetabulum and then we uh, remove the neck and we size it and properly and then we put the stem with the head like this and then we reduce it this procedure takes almost like one and a half hours uh, one and a half hours to two hours in a routine case in certain situations it might take extra half an hour to release the soft tissues to balance it properly and to analyze it properly and uh, to do the best possible thing for the patients yes and you were talking about the artificial hip so how does it stay in place what is it made up of see uh, they, they are basically made up of, of a titanium material or cobalt chromium material and there, there are certain specifications for that thing the in the in the cup what we say it has to go and get sucked inside this uh, the socket the the cup has to go inside there are uh, what we call it as the the surface of the cup is uh, splintered with uh, the uh, certain metals where this bony in growth Mm-hmm. that will hold the uh, cup in a proper position without cement the two categories as uh, i didn't mention but i mentioned now there are two categories of hip replacement surgeries one is cemented mm-hmm. the other is uncemented the trend in india is that we do uncemented hip replacement surgeries it is suggested for anyone who is in any in, in a person who is above like 70 or someone who has osteoporosis in such situations we go, go for the cemented uh, hip replacement surgery but as i was telling you the material is cobalt chromium titanium and uh, there are alloys which is biocompatible and they don't give any reactions in the body okay thank you doctor and uh, what could be some of the complications that you might face during the surgery what could like what could get complicated yeah complications and it's the dreaded thing yes for the patients especially and for the surgeons as well see we we take utmost precaution at a better center at a by a well trained surgeon as well as in a better center with good equipments the complications nowadays it's it's much less much less we call it i, I want to tell you the hip replacement surgery is called the surgery of this 21st 20th century mm-hmm. why i'm telling this thing is it is making the life much better the results are Ex- uh, expectable and they are excellent the uh, satisfaction level of the patients is really high functional recovery or functional outcomes is much much better with total hip replacement surgery so by, by the, uh, saying this thing the life of life expectancy or the longevity of the implant is 
there is a study the data the national registry of hip replacements in many countries at 10th year post surgery the um, the longevity or the life of the implant is 95 percent among 100 patients 95 patients will survive for 10 years with this hip replacement surgery the implant will survive for 10 years and then coming to 25 years survivability of the implant uh, is almost eight mm-hmm. percent so the 80 percent of the chance that the patient with hip replacement surgery can do well uh, for 25 years okay Okay. The complications, yes, the complications per operative, there are blood loss might be there, there might be cardiac arrest and the pulmonary embolism. These are certain things which we definitely take care of it. Uh, almost like it, it is, if it is properly done, the trained hands at proper center, the complications are much, much less. But yes, post operative complications, the most commonest is hip dislocation. The ball comes out of the socket. This, this way, the ball just comes out of the socket. The, the, that's because probably there was not a proper alignment while doing the surgery. The, there was no proper tensioning of the muscles. There might be weakness, weakness of the muscles, and uh, the patient will would have uh, squatted or seated. Or he, he would have been sitting in a cross leg position when the surgeon would have told not to do that thing, and uh, probably even post trauma, uh, mm-hmm. post surgery. The certain these are the more commonest uh, problems which might lead to hip dislocation. The other complications are like infection, uh, pulmonary embolism, and uh, shortening is one of the complications. The limb might be shortened by one centimeter or two centimeter based on some surgeons, uh, this thing, uh, some surgeries. Mm-hmm. Yes. And how much pain would a person have after the surgery? And uh, yeah. How much pain would be? Yeah. See, pain, yes, any surgery will have certain small amount of pain. But yes, if it is done in a proper way, respecting the soft tissues, respecting with minimal trauma while doing the surgery, mm-hmm. and per operative uh, care like minimal blood loss, as well as cauterizing all the vessels with their bleeders. And the most important, uh, the most important role played is by anesthetist. They, uh, if they give a proper combined epidural and spinal anesthesia, the patient will be almost painless for at least 24 hours or 48 hours. And then once this epidural is off, we give certain medicines and the patients will do well. By time of almost three weeks, they'll be able to walk at least, at least a kilometer. Okay. The pain and should subside. The pain will be much better. Mm-hmm. Unlike earlier, nowadays, because of the advancement in the implants, the advancement in the techniques of what we do, the surgery, as well as the anesthesia techniques, the pain management is much better. Okay. And what could one expect after, during the recovery, post-surgery? If you can break it down day-wise, what should they take care of? What should they do? What shouldn't they do? Yes, that's a nice question. Yes, see that that is what patients will be scared. How it will be post surgery? Will they, will they be able to walk? And they, will they be dependent on others? Yes. What I usually tell my patients is the moment they come to the hospital, they'll be completely independent. I don't want any of my attendants to help them. That is the confidence which we have to give, and that is the way it happens in my patients. See, the the day of surgery, usually the surgery, I I post my patients in the early morning hours. And the surgery is done and uh, they will be put in the post-operative ward for two to three hours just to monitor initial post-surgical uh, uh, phase. After, Like at around three o'clock or two o'clock post lunch time, the patients will be given only liquid uh, based on their ability. They will not be given a solid food. And gradually we'll, sh- we'll shift them to, we'll get an x-ray done, post-operative x-ray done and they will shift them to the ward. By evening hours, I personally go to the patients and encourage them to stand at least if they are not able to walk. They will have this, they will be scared, they will be having this fear that something might happen, it's still raw, it's still fresh, the surgery is still just at done. So they will be really scared, but it's not that, that situation. When it is perfectly done, I usually, uh, I make my uh, routine is, I make them walk the same evening, at least 10 steps. They have to walk all by themselves, if possible, with the walker or without the walker as well. Yes, I encourage them. If there are youngsters or if the patient is strong enough mentally and much motivated, and if he's an young patient, they will be able to walk even without the support. They will have that balance. The, this is what I follow for the first day. And certain situations, if the epidural anesthesia is given more and for the pain management, the patient is having more pain, they will be made to just sit on the couch 
they'll be made to make the legs straight and up and down and all that stuff. The next day morning, next morning, we'll change the dressing and put a waterproof sticker from mm-hmm. where they can even have shower uh, and we'll be training them to go and use the restroom. They will train them to go and use the commode. And uh, in certain situations, like someone who is really tall and someone who is on a heavier side and someone who is aged, we give a commode uh, extension. We, we have a small, equipment, small uh, device where the commode is extended by four inches. So by doing that thing, we encourage them to start being completely independent, use a walker or the walking frame to walk and use the commode. Like what we, we encourage them to come back to the activities of daily living. At least they should take care of themselves all by themselves. From next day, uh, 48 hours post-surgery, usually we are, I advise my patients to go back home if they're comfortable. Some people like to stay for one more day and then they go home. So for 14 days, they have to stay indoors. They, keep, they have to keep doing the exercises, what we teach, like raising their leg and uh, walking and doing some quadriceps, isometric strengthening exercises, the hip muscles around the... Uh, the muscles around the hip joint and like after two weeks we remove the stitches the clips will be removed and the st- uh, stitches are removed three weeks from the uh, surgery date they'll be allowed to go outside wherever they want and they can even walk for a kilometer okay so uh, three weeks is when they can get back to their normal routine to do their daily work and like get back yes, to some people life. yeah it all depends upon person to person basically mm-hmm. almost like 80 or 90 percent of patients they'll be back to almost normal by three weeks that is the time what the soft tissues will take to heal up right yeah, yeah. and yes audience if you have any questions for the doctor please leave it in the comment section and all your questions will be answered and doctor next question is uh, is anything i mean does the patient have to do anything to prepare their home for the surgery can they use an Indian commode or do they need, uh, do they have to be only in the ground floor, not climbing stairs, things like that? Exactly. That's an excellent question. See, yes, they have to make preparation for uh, getting a commode done if they have an Indian toilet. Indian toilet should be completely avoided for the rest of the life. With the hip replacement surgery, if there is an artificial joint in the hip or the knee, mm-hmm. they are suggested to use only a commode. Uh, if they say, use an uh, Indian toilet, the chances of dislocations are much higher because mm-hmm. as such, it's an art children. Other than that, the patients will be completely normal. They'll be able to do almost all the activities what a normal person can do. Uh, you cannot expect them to run or jump or something like that. But yes, they'll be able to walk for kilometers. Uh, for kilometers is what I'm mentioning again and again. Yes. So what adjustments they have to do at home is keep the uh, restroom ready. They should, it is suggested that they should have certain support system at the bathroom so that if in case they are not able to get up by themselves, they should hold that thing and get up. That is one thing. Climbing stairs, yes, they can do from the day one if only one hip is replaced. Or if both the hips are also replaced, there are certain patients where they climb both the, uh, using both the hips. So usually hip replacement surgery is done for only one hip. So that, that person can climb the stairs from day one. Okay. So that is not an hindrance uh, from them getting uh, to, or change an apartment or change a house to stay in a ground floor, nothing like that. Yes, they can climb for at least a floor. Okay. These are the changes what I suggest. Okay. Okay. Thank you, doctor. And I would like to let our audience know that if you would like to consult Dr. Kiran, please call us on 7026-200-200. At this time of global pandemic, I'm sure all of you would be scared, but at Medfin, we have risk-free zones. We take all precautions and also offer video consultation when required. You can also visit our clinics because it is risk-free environment. There are certain protocols which we follow to give you a you know, safe and risk-free treatment. Fever screening is done before entering the hospital. History of past illness is taken. Smell test, chest x-ray for the patient and the attender. Travel history is taken. Location check. People from red zones will not be allowed. Check on Arogya Setu app and only one attender per patient is allowed. So all of this will ensure speedy and faster, safer recovery. So do not fear. And coming back to hip replacement, doctor, are there chances of the implants failing? Yes, there are chances. Like, see, what happens is, that's what I was telling you earlier, like, uh, there are 
certain situations when the patient, there are uh, patients criteria and the surgeons criteria and the hospitals also. See, the, if the proper implant is used in a proper setup by a trained surgeon, the chances of failure are much lesser from the surgeon's perspective. The patient's criteria are like the patients who are diabetic, someone who, whose immunity is much less, they, they have a higher chance that they can get the infection. So, mm -hmm. infection is one of the reasons which might loosen the implants. There's one more criteria called as aseptic loosening. There's no reason that the, sometimes the implants will become loose, which is very rare in this present scenario with the advances in the technology, with the implant, with uh, regards to the surgeon's training and um, hospital equipments and hospital setup. Very important is even the surgical techniques. The failure rates with hip replacement surgery is almost negligible is what I want to say it. Okay, and what is the course of action in case it fails? So, is there another surgery which is done, or it does it depend on every case? Yeah, there is solution for every problem. We will we have to evaluate the patient at depth. We have to rule out infection. We have to rule out what is the cause that the implant has failed or the surgery has failed. Mm -hmm. uh, based on that thing, we go ahead with the revision replacement surgery. There are advanced implants available for the even reconstruction of the astabular side or the femoral side with uh, advanced materials and implants. We are able to achieve that the person will get a better hip again, uh, functional hip where he can be back to normal again. Okay. And how would one know if they have an infection at the incision? How can they... Uh, they see, the, usually we do a dressing. We have a look. Uh, I usually suggest to all my friends also, including myself, that we need to keep seeing the patients as much as possible. Uh, in my setup, probably, we have a highly motivated... Uh, I usually motivate my patients and encourage them and give them that confidence. And my team is well-trained and our staff, let it be a nursing staff, or even an ayah, for that matter, they are well trained, they will be knowing what to do and what not to do. So mm -hmm. this, this all things will be there, the patients will have much confidence when the surgeon also sees them uh, like at least once in three days or four days post even discharge. So mm -hmm. the wound is seen till later, the suture remo sutures are removed. There are certain situations, even post like three months or four months, uh, there might be leak from the wound, which is really rare. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And what are some of the latest advancements in the hip surgery? In hip surgery. Yes. Yes. Uh, advances in the hip replacement surgery. Yes. It's it's related to the techniques. It is related to advances related to the techniques, advances related to the implants and materials what we use, and advances uh, uh, in form of uh, the pain management and anesthesia and blood loss also control of blood loss. So yes, because of the combined epidural anesthesia and certain types of drugs, we are able to contain the minimal blood loss. We are able to achieve minimal blood loss intraoperatively. We have started using a tenexamic acid, which will reduce the intraoperative bleed as well as postoperative bleed. Uh, there is a debate going on uh, whether it has to be given intra, like uh, operative site as well as intravenous. We do both the things um, at our center. So in this way, we are able to control uh, the blood loss and uh, prevent blood transfusions, related blood transfusions. And um, that is one thing. Second thing is regarding pain. The advancement is about this epidural anesthesia that we will give much better pain relief to the patients. Regarding advancement in regards to the surgical techniques, yes, we have started doing surgeries in the supine position. That is, the patient will be lying flat instead of on the lateral side. We, we call it as an as a, as a, as a anterior approach for the hip replacement surgery. Uh, again, the, it all depends upon the surgeon's preference and the patient's requirement. The dislocation rates are less is what we call, we have established with the anterior approach. Dislocation rates are much lesser with the anterior approach. Uh, saying that thing, uh, the posterior approach or posterior lateral approach, what we usually do is an excellent procedure because we have kept on doing it and since many years. We, and it has got a data saying that the results are excellent of uh, hip surviving for more than 25 years with this procedure. So uh, this is regarding the techniques as well. Now coming to the implants, the instruments or the material, what we use for the hip replacement surgery. There are three, three uh, important things. One is ceramic on... Uh, we call it the materials here, the head of the femur, the stem for the femoral side is ceramic. 
and at the uh, hip side this is ceramic and then on the uh, hip side is also ceramic so there are three categories ceramic on ceramic second thing is ceramic on poly and third thing is metal on poly for someone who is like 70 and above we don't suggest a ceramic on poly that because of the cost is bit on a higher side so these three materials are nowadays the polyethylene or the plastic what we use is highly costly polyethylene mm -hmm. the wear and tear of the polyethylene is much less and the longevity is increased with this advanced technologies Okay. This is about the techniques here and the, the materials which will give a better quality of life, increase the functional ability, as well as um, uh, minimal complications and uh, uh, long longevity of the implant. Right. And is there any lay age limit for somebody who could go through the surgery? Yeah. Age relation, yes. See, uh, I have operated a hip replacement surgery. I have done for a person who is around 18 uh till uh 92 oh, so wow. there is no age bar you oh. ask see uh, you ask any 80 80 uh, old guy who is around 80 plus he doesn't want to live with pain he doesn't want to have a crippled life he doesn't want to uh, have a uh, like a mercy life he wants to live a happy functional painless life right. so yes there is no contraindications per se regarding age Okay. And uh, finally, to give some of your tips, how, what could somebody do to maintain a healthy hip? Yeah, I keep telling everyone to have a check on the weight. Very mm -hmm. important. Let it be a male or a female. Let it be a gentleman or ladies. They have to uh, keep walking as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I suggest them to walk on a plain surfaces. Mm -hmm. Walk for kilometers, don't avoid this thing. Even if they have pain, I tell them don't stop walking. At least by walking, the muscles on the hip and knee will be stronger and that will support the damaged hip if they have it. So for a healthy person also, just to avoid any complications, just to avoid uh, getting this uh, problems is to keep walking, strengthen the muscles, do some sort of yoga that is flexibility or stretching and strengthening of the muscles around hip and knee joint and also the back. Back is very important. By doing such uh, these activities and having a healthy, nutritious diet, uh, everyone will be much better. Okay. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for joining us. I'm sure our audience got a lot of information.